Hello, everybody. Um, just so you're aware, we've got we've started a poll. We're going to have a few poll questions kind of throughout. Um, just trying to get at this point in time a sense of who all is uh, in the audience and watching us uh, and participating in this. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Nick Krogan, uh, who's our host for tonight. Uh, but at least wanted to to get that out there for you. Thank you, Jerry, and good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Nick Krogan, and I am the director of the Pensacola Museum of Art. Tonight, we are pleased to present Navigating Creativity in Times of Change, a state of the arts panel discussion that will explore the impacts of this year's challenges on the demand, delivery, and support for creative projects and programs. The panel will feature local visual and performing artists who are navigating their careers among the present environment's unfolding changes. The format for this panel will include questions, audience polling, and organic conversations that arise between the panelists as they share their experiences. Tonight's installment is being presented in partnership with the UWF College of Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities Experience UWF Downtown Lecture Series. The series is sponsored by the UWF Office of Equity and Diversity and is funded in part by the John C. Pace Symposium Series. We will be partnering on several future installments during this academic year, and we hope you'll be able to join us for our next event on November 19th, when we host Poet Laureate Joy Harjo as she shares insights into her work in American Sunrise. More information on the series can be found at uwf.edu slash downtown lectures. Now behind me in my Zoom background, you will see a detailed shot of Cuban born American artist, Sergio Garcia's Wasanga Man. This is a work from the PMA's permanent collection and is featured in our exhibition titled, A Question of When. It is on display through December 6th. This exhibition was curated by Anna Wall as a response to our evolving world amid the COVID-19 pandemic and as a reflection on the unique role of art in times of change. Contemplating the relationships between the struggles these exhibiting artists faced and challenges facing our contemporary colleagues formed the seed and springboard for tonight's discussion. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Yes. Marcy J. Duncan has an extensive list of theater and film credits. Marcy just completed an upcoming web series, Man of the House, and her first season at the Kentucky Shakespeare Festival. Marcy currently teaches at UWF as well as acting classes with her acting studio, Artists at Play. Valerie George is an artist whose work over the past 20 years has reflected holistically on art and life in the form of installation art, video, performance, sound, sculpture, photography, new media drawing, collaborative projects, and curatorial practices. She is one of the newest members of Good Children Gallery in New Orleans and will exhibit a solo exhibition in April 2021. Kat Gold holds a BFA in musical theater and was most recently seen in La Cage La Folle at Arizona Broadway Theater in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm sure I pronounced that horribly, um, please forgive me. But she is also a Silver Palm Award recipient and has received several nominations for Best Supporting Actress in a Musical. Quincy Q. Hull is a poet and co-founder of Pensacola Poetry, one of the longest running open mic poetry events in Pensacola history. He has been a member of Still Black Sea Writers and Artists Guild for over 10 years and has traveled extensively, reading and speaking in venues across the nation. He is the author of several books and albums of poetry and is a frequent guest speaker at the University of West Florida. Bass baritone Lloyd Richard has performed opera professionally since 2006. Since then, he has performed in theaters all over the US. In addition to his performance career, Lloyd is the former executive director for the performing arts nonprofit, Arts at St. John's in Miami Beach. He is currently artistic director and performer in Viola, The Song Cycle. And finally, I would like to introduce our moderator, Jerry Brisky. Jerry is the director of the UWF Center for Fine and Performing Arts and teaches stage management, stage management and arts administration. With that, I'd like to, again, thank all of our panelists and everyone who is attending virtually and pass the proverbial mic over to Jerry. Hello, everybody. Um, and um, I wish I could see you. That That's the part that's hard. Um, I'm seeing myself basically on screen. So um, welcome um, everyone to this. Um, 
when I was asked to do this, or actually when I found out about this um, panel being put together, um, I immediately contacted Nick and, uh, and the cash dean's office and said, how can I get involved? I want to be involved in this. Um, for those of you who know me, you know my passion for um, the arts across the board. Um, and this has been a really rough time. And what better way than to get um, a group of artists, um, you know, predominantly local artists to talk about the effect that um, all of the last, you know, of everything that's been going on over the last seven or, or eight months has um, had on um, the arts, um, because it has been a huge, tremendous effect. Um, we started, uh, we started outing uh, with, with a poll um, and Anna, if you can share that now with everybody, uh, we do have a few um, a few artists in the in the audience, um, and I know that not everyone. Um, we we've had some more people kind of come in since uh, we we closed the first poll, um, and we just wanted to get a sense of who was out there um, and who was a part of this. Um, so. Uh, those of you who know me can know I can talk nonstop. I'm going to try not to. So I'm actually going to turn it over and ask the first question at this point in time. Um, uh, Anna, let's go ahead and put up the second poll where, so people can start answering that as we uh, start talking. Um, So first off, I want to ask uh, for those of you um, with the stopping of performances and, uh, and events that happened back in March, um, how has that affected you? Um, what did you lose at this point in time? Um, and I'll start with Q, actually, if, if, uh, if, if that's OK. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Well, at that time, I was the host of a weekly uh, open mic, and it definitely it stopped our weekly open mic. So, uh, and that went on for about two months. We started back in June, but in the midst of that, I think we lost a good part of our core audience because we, as artists, we depend on the audience. And during that time, the fear was still pretty high. So even after we started back in June, a lot of people haven't come back yet. We found a new audience, but so for me as an artist and a host, I lost a lot. I lost my weekly. It's kind of like a church member and you're not having your your Sunday service. So for me, it was it made my nine to five a lot harder, not having my weekly event to where I can express ourselves. So so it was a big loss for us at, at the time. It was a definitely a big loss. But now that we're back, it's kind of like we're back to normal, pretty much. As much right. normality as we can have this time anyway. Right. So who else? Who else wants to talk about that? Cat? Kat, go ahead. Hi, uh, Nick. It was very close, Lakaja Fall. So um, <laughs> I was, I was uh, doing Lakaja out at Arizona Broadway Theater um, from January through March. March fifteenth, the governor had shut down our show. They shut down any show that had an audience over uh, fifty people in the space. So we all kind of got shipped home. So I immediately lost the end of my contract. Um, at the time, no one knew that it was going to last this long. So theaters were still doing virtual auditions, virtual callback, have you. And I was in final callbacks for about four shows. And all of those have been canceled or rescheduled. So I work a, a, about two thirds of the year. So a huge amount of my work has definitely disappeared. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that too, Kat, because I was in the midst of a opera contract in Delaware and um, it, we had a similar situation where we were in rehearsals, but we hadn't launched yet. Uh, we had about two more weeks before we were um, performing live and we thought we could stay an extra week and, and then we were just still rehearsing and then we couldn't have like 15 people, then we couldn't have 10 people, then we couldn't have five people. And at that point we had, um, you know, the general director had to make a decision that to let us go on March 19th. Um, and that's kind of just shut down everything, particularly in the performing arts operatic side of the world. It literally just, that's everyone's work stopped at that moment. Um, and some of it is coming back, but um, a lot of it is still canceled indefinitely or will not be coming back. 
Um, I have one contract that's postponed till next year because it didn't happen yet. But even then, they're trying to figure out what their budget is going to be. So it, it was pretty it was pretty abrupt um, when it happened. Hey Val, how about you from, from the visual art world? Well, a million things um, obviously have gone under, and but me personally, the things that impacted me the most was. Um, a couple of things, and I'm sure Nick can speak to some of them. Um, I was working with my um, great, sweet collaborators on the 309 Punk Museum project, and those of you who are local are aware that we've raised um, some money to help uh, save a house that has a long history of, of punk culture, and we were just about to open our artist in residence program, um, which we were bringing people from all over the United States, and certainly a diverse group of people who were going to contribute to the Pensacola economy and cultural economy, and we were really excited to start it. And sadly, because of COVID, we are having to pay rent on an empty house. Oh. And that breaks our hearts. Um, but also just from living on that side of the nonprofit world, thinking about um, the place where I'm showing right now at Alabama Contemporary, um, I had, we installed right as COVID was breaking and they let me know that before COVID, there were about 700 visitors a month. And now during COVID, we get about 73. And then gallery night or art walk um, generally is like 800 visitors. And now uh, the last one was, we only had 56 guests. And while that's smart and we're great that everyone's staying inside and being safe, what it does is it really hurts a lot of these nonprofits that are trying desperately to demonstrate that they're serving a community and to get grants to serve that community. But without the numbers, it's hard to prove it. And so that's something that's been on my mind a lot. Yeah, Marcy. I would say um, from a university perspective, we were um, where we teach young artists to become professional artists. We were um, cast and in rehearsal um, and our students went away for spring break and they were informed that they will not be able to finish their show. And we had seniors who were very much so looking forward to gracing the stage for their last opportunity. So it was very difficult for those students to process um, what that really meant and uh, the show that they were choreographing, designing, uh, preparing roles for, learning songs for, had already made moments and created moments with each other that all came crashing down. And so then us as you know, professors, we became psychologists, we became comforters, we um, you know, became a tighter community as a result, but it was very difficult, I would say. And the last point I would make to that from a university teaching these young artists perspective is that a lot of our students lost contracts. They were booked from their spring auditions and they were informed um, later in the process of this COVID, uh, July in, moving towards the, the summer, that their contracts that they had, had auditioned for, that they had hoped and prayed for, that they had celebrated, that they had told mom about, those were all going away. And so that was pretty devastating because graduating, you wanna have a job when you graduate and those jobs that they were depending on uh, were no more. Yeah, that was that was really, really rough kind of across the board in all three areas was to suddenly see that the big conclusion of the senior years um, kind of shut down um, for, for these students who were graduating. Um, Anna, can we go ahead and post that poll, the results from that poll that we just had? Um, so yes, um, it, it definitely, and, and I think Q um, and uh, Kat both kind of responded to that a little bit in the changing of the audiences and how the audiences have changed. At the CFPA, we're still not having um, any real, any in-person events right now. So we're, we're trying to figure out that sort of interaction with our um, outside audience. Um, we actually have a, a question, kind of a follow-up question that I wanted to ask. Um, 
And um, I don't have a good answer for it. So I'm hoping one of you two do. Um, most of you have lost opportunities through the past few months because of the pandemic. Looking back from this point, what would you have done differently to uh, try and avoid these losses? Quincy, go ahead. Um, well, for me, I guess uh, it's been a good reality check for me. I'm not the most technologically inclined individual. I'm old school. You know, I still got turntables and cassette players and VCRs in my house. So um, I would have thought ahead and been a little bit more tech savvy because I'm having to depend on that now. Full of, right. So I, I do more uh, of these things now than I've ever done in my life. So uh, I'm still having people on my side kind of work it and tweak it for me. So, uh, so I think I would have been a little bit more ahead of the game and been a little bit more uh, tech savvy if, as yeah. people have been trying to get me to be for years, but I'm just so, such a dinosaur, you know what I mean? I just like my, my old school stuff. So, but I'm learning now and I, I'll be better prepared for the next event that comes up. So. Yeah, how about you Lloyd? Uh, yeah, I definitely will piggyback on that. Tech savviness would have been the biggest thing in any of the performing arts. Uh, but particularly for me, because now I do use it a lot in the work that I'm doing now as an artist. Um, and it was useful before, but it's become more so now. I think also in that question, there's a sense that maybe sometimes, maybe financially or something that artists could have done something differently to prepare. But uh, what a lot of people don't understand about the performing arts is you have a force majeure contract. And that force majeure contract means that if a catastrophic global events are an act of God, if you will, or to take place that your contract becomes null and void. So to find a contract or to find work that extends you beyond those contracts is, is a really difficult thing. And for, for arts in the United States specifically, for arts in the United States, that is one of the biggest issues that's happening in the performing arts operatic world right now is adjusting those type of contracts. Yeah, Kat. Um, I guess following up on that, um, I definitely would have taken more like classes to do self tapes. I've done self tapes before and I, I kind of roughed it because I, I, I usually go in person for all of my auditions. Um, but now you have to have the ring light, you have to have your entire setup, decent camera and what have you. And then I think also it, it was impossible, like there's nothing really you could have done to like not lose a contract because of a catastrophic event, you know, like a pandemic. Um, it's just, yeah, having better equipment and then also to keep your contracts. Um, a lot of people are looking towards social media and seeing how you're using it during this time to keep yourself relevant and to keep uh, theater um, producers, directors, eyes on you. So when things come back, they're looking at certain people already when auditions start happening again. Right. Yeah, so uh, thank you guys uh, for, for that. Um, we're gonna change it, uh, uh, go to the next event, major event that we've been dealing with over the last um, eight months or so. Uh, can we run up the next poll, Anna, for me? And then the question is, um, how has the ongoing uh, Black Lives Matter protest changed your approach to the arts? Um, has it affected your work? What are you looking to do, et cetera? Who wants to jump in first? Kat, go ahead. Thank you. I guess for me, um, now that everyone has to be actively against racism and actively pro Black Lives Matter. And that definitely affects how I view um, auditioning for theater companies, because if they aren't supporting this movement, if they aren't um, actively trying to employ more um, people of color, I don't wanna work with them. So that's kind of affected my world. I'm a white passing mixed person. So I haven't been directly affected personally, but it definitely changes my view on theater companies and who I want to be associated with, who I want to work with. Q, Q first, and then we'll go down to Marcy. All right, so um, for me, um, 
I like what um, she just said. I think as an artist, to me, I want to know what the audience response is to it. So I guess for my white audience, I want them to be more responsible. But for me, um, my first CD, my first book, I've always written about police brutality. So it's not new for me. It's, I've, I've always seen it. I'm 50 years old. I've always seen it. So I, I don't, I haven't really adjusted my art to it because my art is always, I'm a poet. So I always have to have my ears to the street. So, and I write based off what my ears and my eyes tell me. So it's nothing new in that regard for me. It's been around since slavery has ended. So that's not new. The reaction to it, I'm not always happy about that because sometimes it fades and it passes when things get quiet, we get quiet. But for me, I'm always going to be loud about it because it hasn't, I know it doesn't go away. So I have to continue to keep my pen hot and keep writing about those things. And I'm always curious to know how the audience is taking it. So my white audience, I want them to be more responsible. I want them to be, I want them to be more selective of people who they want to choose to deal with based off of how people are in general when it comes to just dealing with what we're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. So it hasn't really changed me, but I'm a little bit more conscious about the people who I want to be connected with based off of how they deal with the injustices that we're dealing with. And but my writing is the same. And, and how, how, have you seen a huge change in, in um, the audience that you're, you're drawing in uh, based off of that um, as, as more people who aren't of color um, uh, realize what's been going the, the with the most recent stuff there's there's been more of a realization I think in a lot of ways so is there has there been a reaction from that standpoint it has been I would say I have I've noticed a slight increase but again I'm the verdict isn't out I don't know how genuine it is I don't know if it's right. going to be a passing thing I think because it's it seems to be the right thing to do right now but I don't know how long it's going to last so I'm not celebrating it yet Right. until I see if these people are going to be around once the news media stops reporting it, as they always do, until the next thing happens and then it comes back again. So I'm just basically doing my part to make sure those people understand that this is something that we've always dealt with. And if you're going to be on board, then you need to be on board full time, not part time. How about you, Marcy? Well, I would have to agree with um, Quincy and um, Kat. To Quincy's point, Yes, this is something, you know, that uh, as an African American woman, uh, I experience and live in, you know, on a day to day basis. Um, And I think what the Black Lives Matter movement or the resurgence of it, because this movement is not new, it has been around for for a second. Um, But the resurgence, this last resurgence of it um, has done for me in particular because um, of George Floyd and Aubrey is it allowed me to have a new form awareness of the many ways that I was um, being very passive and being very accepting and being um, very um, head to the ground, if you will, as far as not really addressing these issues when I saw them and when I experienced them. This movement, I think for me, and being the, you know, the only um, African-American member in my department, um, for me, it has given me a newfound boldness to speak my truth, to live my truth, to call out things that are um, absolutely improper and racist and wrong and not being ashamed anymore to fear that I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to step on somebody's toes and they're gonna think I'm the angry black woman. You know, those things at this time in our, you know, history, those are trivial. And those types of thoughts are sabotaging to my blackness. And I am proud and I am walking in it in a new way because of this Black Lives Matter movement. And I feel like I have the support of not only, you know, people of color, but also my white, Caucasian, other sisters and brothers, because they have also stepped up. They have also emailed me and called me and and walked alongside with me. And for that, you know, I feel validated because of the movement first. And then secondly, because my friends who are not people of color have also started to stand up for what is simply decent, what is right. (laughs) 
Lloyd? Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring this up because in the performing arts world for opera specifically, it's very subjective about how you are cast and we are doing very often European stories. And so for a person of color to be in opera specifically, you're already breaking that boundary from the get go because to get cast in a leading role that was supposed to be a European white person, or, or, you know, is a very um, different thing. Now that is a whole nother issue I won't touch, but what I've seen and what's happened to me specifically in opera since the pandemic and since uh, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and others is that I've been asked at least by two different opera companies to speak about um, racial reconciliation or to speak about my experience. Um, I've had private conversations with two general directors of opera companies that have sat with me for hours over Zoom to ask about how they can be more inclusive in their companies. Um, so there are places that are doing the work. Um, even in Florida, Opera Orlando is right now doing it, um, a re uh, Representation Matters whole uh, talk about that and has contacted all of their uh, artists that they've worked with in the past and that they're going to work with in the future that they have had on the roster for the future to um, speak about why representation and diversity matters. So that's something that's uniquely given me an opportunity to speak up with my own voice. Um, before the pandemic, I actually had an opportunity where I was in a Northern state, I will not state which, but I was asked as a uh, artist in residence to come in and speak at a uh, panel similar to this, but it was in person at the time um, about uh, colorblind casting and what Northern high schools and such should do if they do not have racial diversity at their school, but they want to do West Side Story. Or if they wanted to, you know, how are they going to, you know, can we perform Old Man River if we are not, you know, Joe, who is supposed to be a black person. <laughs> you know, those kind of things are, have been questions that have been floating in the performing arts world for a long time, but it requires emerging artists like myself to now speak about those things and educate myself about those things as much as anybody else. And, um, and, and it's a good thing, but it's also uncomfortable because you become the black person who is the token or the pariah or those kind of places in, in your place. But I think I've taken the stance where it's necessary to have the conversation. And if, if I will, I'm open to it. Not everybody is open to it. And I think that's what has to be important because for a lot of people, particularly black women, it's a trauma. It's an active trauma. Um, for black men, it's an active trauma. I didn't know what JPay was until very recently. You know, most black men don't know what that is until they've had to encounter that, you know? And so having those conversations is important, but we also have to make sure that you know, we people are ready to have those conversations or willing to have the conversations in a in a artistic setting. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm gonna. Uh kind of change topics a little bit more. Um, just a reminder for everybody, um, you know, we could take one one of these topics and talk for hours on it. Um, so I'm trying to trying to, to hit everybody. If you do have like follow up questions or, or anything like that for our audience, feel free to use the Q&A um, button down at the bottom of the screen, you should have a little Q&A. Uh, we do have somebody monitoring that, that, that can get things to us. Um, so my next question is um, uh, kind of going along those same ways um, with um, how have you seen the accepted canon of artists um, in each discipline change recently, if it has. So from the standpoint for, for those of you who may not, um, the audience members, when I when we talk about the canon of artists, it's really the, the, the artists that are being performed or that are being presented or that are being taught uh, to students. Um, you know, with especially within uh, the theater community, that has been a very white audience, uh, you know, a white canon with very few exceptions. Um, 
and getting, you know, trying to expand beyond that is something that, uh, that if they haven't been doing it already, their students, the faculty are starting, trying to start doing it now. Um, so does anybody have anything they'd like to add with that, Marcy? say from the university perspective as if that's my that's my contribution here, to, here today I also perform as well but I, I mostly teach um I would say that since I've arrived um there has been conversation in our department specifically in the theater department about diversifying um our department um the students that we have uh in our department as well as the shows that we do um, and so it, it is quite the dilemma because you cannot do diverse shows if you don't have the diversity of students. You do not have, um, and, and so when you cannot market these shows to show that you are a diverse institution or not institution, but department, it's kind of hard to get those students in the door because they are, they, they understand, you know, if I'm the only one, uh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> what, what am I gonna do? So it is quite the dilemma and it takes hard work. It takes a lot of intentionality, um, being very specific and being very intentional about going after uh, diverse students, going in spaces that are diverse, celebrating diversity when we get a chance. If we have students that are from Uruguay, for example, not um, you know, coming down on them because they have an accent, you know, in the theater, you know, that is their contribution to, to us, right? As a part of our mission to be diverse. So to, to kind of touch on, you know, your question, Jerry, I think it is, it is quite the dilemma to be intentional about changing the canon of what you present to the people. It, because in order to do that, you have to have the people to put on those diverse shows. And it's kind of hard to get the people in the door to do those shows if you're all one color, <laughs> right? Right. Because, you know, people of color, or I won't even say people of color, that would be intimidating to me to, to come into a space uh, like that. Lloyd, did you want to add to that as well? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Oh, no, I, I was just going, amen, sister. Amen. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, just to follow up, if you don't have Hispanic um, students, you should not be doing West Side Story. That's the general rule. So, <laughs> Kat? I guess go going on following uh, off of what Marcy said, um, theater should only be presented theater should be presenting the material with the people they have in mind they should not i do not want to see white people doing in the heights i and and shows shows like lend me a tenor should are, are definitely not happening as much but they shouldn't be happening at all they should there shouldn't be shows with people um in black face or yellow face, those should be removed. And I think it's also the responsibility of actors to be diligent about what contracts they'll accept. Um, Cause a lot, of, a lot of actors, especially people that I've worked with, they were like, well, I have brown hair so I can audition for West Side Story. That is not the show for you. Even like, because I'm white and Asian, people often think that, I, that I'm Latina and people have tried to hire me for Latina roles. And I always refuse them because I'm not Latina, that is not my story. I have no business telling that story. And I think along with the theater producers, the directors, actors should be diligent on what roles they'll accept because they, it's, it's wrong and they don't want that following them. I think it should stop. I, if I could, Kat, and I'm gonna shut up, I promise. But I think that is so important. It is so important because these stories about people of color are not as abundant and they haven't been told for as long as people, the major, of the people of the majority, right? So these stories are sacred. They are sacred and they really should be done in a historical 
um, respectful manner, just like you would do um, a, 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 a piece that requires certain type of candor and care, right? You know, there was a story about, uh, I don't remember the details, but there was a story about uh, um, the mountaintop. That's the story about by Katori Hall. It's a story about Martin Luther King and, you know, his passing over to the other side. And they cast Martin Luther King as a white man, you know, with to to kind of deal with racial issues that came up from that. And my 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 point to your point, Kat, those stories are not for the purpose of of exploration. They are sacred stories and they are for people of color. They are for people of color and they should not be taken out of context. And because we don't get that option on the flip side, right. <laughs> we don't get to do that on the flip side. So I think the respect should be given to those, you know, playwrights and to the, to the uh, intention at which they have created those works of, of art. Okay, follow-up question from the audience. Uh, for with this, uh, what has the influence or impact of the diverse casting of Hamilton had on the artist about how they think about diversity and roles? Because we're, we, Marcy, you brought up that the story isn't, you're not allowed to do it the opposite direction, so it shouldn't work one way. So we're now talking about an entire movement, an entire um, kind of going back to color conscious casting. Uh, from that, or very specifically with Lynn uh, Man Manuel Miranda's uh, thing of purposely casting people of color in these in these very historic roles. I think that was the playwright's intention. Right, it was. It very much was. That's a very important, you know, um, consideration, specifically about Hamilton. That was right. the playwright's intention, and of celebrating diversity and looking at things in a different light with that in mind. So I yeah. do want to point that. Yeah. Yes, I was gonna also bring up because I don't I don't want to say that to cloak the term of devil's advocate, but this is a, a huge and delicate question, particularly in um, opera, because very often we're like I stated, we're performing European things that were not meant for people of color initially to have even been performing those things. Um, and it only was later uh, coming into the US where, US where that became um, more popularized and people like Black Patty and Marian Anderson and Leontine Price and um, Jesse Norman, they started coming and performing and just killing the game, if you will. And, <laughs> and, and they had to open up space. And so when you look at a show like Hamilton or Porgy and Bess or Showboat, these shows specifically were talking about race. And there's, that's, a, that's an element of the show that is very important for the American story specifically. Right. And so I think when we look at some of these things or some of these performing art things, we have to look at them in the lens of the story and the, of the culture that they're trying to tell. If you do an Aida, Verdi was not saying, well, only Ethiopians can and Egyptians can be in this thing. His mindset was not that at the time. As, as a matter of fact, it was quite far from that because there were only Italians singing these roles at the time. And so that stipulation is not there. But when you look at something like Porgy and Bess, which the Metropolitan Opera just did, Gershwin's requested and required that as long as someone has this work that it is only black people who are performing in the chorus and who are performing in the lead roles and the only time a white person can be there is when they're the cop and <laughs> they because it is speaking a specific story you know so if you take it out of that context like hungry did um, then all of a sudden you'll have a situation where the story is not really being told in the way it was originally intended to address certain things um, and then there's another side where people are repurposing stories. So we have to think about that too. I think Hamilton somewhat falls under that because we know that the American story is a, a majority white narrative and where people of color come into that narrative is in a subjective or inferior role. We understand that in European culture and we understand that in American culture as well. And so we have to be mindful that if we're gonna cast 
a person of color in a role like that, what is that really going to say if we have them in a disparaging role? And so Lynn manuel Miranda's uh, foresight in saying, let this be a full American story. Let everybody be able to speak about this, takes the eye a little bit off of the race factor so much about the American story and says that we're inclusive, even if maybe our constitution is not so inclusive in its language, or even if maybe some of our laws is not so inclusive, or even if our presidents and vice presidents don't want to denounce white supremacy is still says we are all still here. And so I think that's what makes that kind of art powerful. Right. Okay, I'm gonna change the subject again, cause once again, we're, we're already running out of time in so many ways. Uh, we're about two thirds of the way through this. Um, so, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time to do so because there are a couple of other really good follow-up questions uh, from audience members I want to get back to if we have the opportunity to. Um, <clears throat> so we've talked about this briefly. Um, what strategies have you implemented to continue showing your artistic endeavors with everything that is going on? Val? I mean, Everybody else is doing it. We're just all moving online. <laughs> and it is at the detriment, I think, to some work, um, some visual artist work for sure. And um, because art is so experiential. And um, when we experience artwork online, sometimes we're only getting a tiny glimpse um, into that experience. And uh, I'm grateful for it, um, for sure. And it does keep a little bit of a connection um, between myself and my, I wanna say my friends, because I feel like the people who look at my work the most and the most intently are some of my my, my friends. But like, certainly I also have an audience of, of, a, of uh, viewers who, who follow me. Um, but I'm grateful for the online experience, but it is definitely quite a difference and quite a quite a challenge to navigate. Q. All right, I was um, feeling a little nervous. I haven't been quiet for so long. It's just <laughs> new for me to be quiet this long. Uh, <laughs> so what I've done recently um, with the help of other artists, uh, we there's this group of artists and videographers that call the Yellow Door Experience. It's kind of like Tiny Desk. So we'll be done, we, we're doing videos outside and I've enjoyed that. So I'm able to take the, the poetry and create a visual sense with it at the same time. So I take my words and I create a scene around words. Like one poem I have about, um, it's kind of off the Billie Holiday, uh, Strange Fruit. So I did the video in front of a tree and getting people that sense of that visual about, about us hanging from trees back in that sense. And I have a, a vocalist as well as live musicians, drummers, uh, guitar players, and we we'll all just do videos outside. So it's opened up a whole new door where I can take the poetry outside and we can mix it in with other artists as well, videographers, as well as musicians. So that's been very, very enjoyable. And it's actually uh, being able to put it up on YouTube. It's actually brought the audience out to where, wherever we are now because of the videos, because there's a whole group of people who just watch videos. So now we can blend blend them in as well to what we're trying to do. And it actually expands the audience uh, viewership a lot more doing it this way. So, and I like being outside anyway, because it's more organic and it's more energetic for me to be outside. So I still feel like I have that audience that I need because I'm an energetic kind of artist. I really like, I'll do behind the video. I prefer to be in front of people who can respond because I build off of that audience energy. So that's what makes me energetic is the energy that they give me back. So I don't lose that with the video since I can still create that. And we can have people outside on the street who haven't seen us do anything. And they just come up when they see people outside performing in the middle of the yard. So, so that's been what we've added to the play lately. So, and it's been, it's been a good experience. Yeah, Kat. I, um, at least from my perspective, from like the musical theater realm, um, I've, I've gotten to do a few, um, virtual cabarets people are getting very creative how they're doing the cabarets they're doing it outside and then streaming part of it so they can get requests through i've done pre-recorded and um 
just I guess for musical theater it's a little bit easier because you can pre-record the songs and a lot of theater companies now um, are switching over and doing virtual plays you can audition for all around the country um, just kind of like radio play style um, because we're having to put together our own costumes our own what app what have you and so people are doing that and then also just because I theater is it, it's really a connection with the audience and stuff at least to kind of replace that I've just been diving into different art art forms a lot of painting a lot of learning instruments developing new skills to kind of well round me in this period of isolation yeah Marcy I would say that my online virtual coaching has increased <laughs> I'm doing a lot a lot of of um, active coaching uh, via zoom these days and Google Hangouts um, it is different and it took a while because um, to, for me to really get used to this new medium. I've not been a stranger to technology and not afraid to dive into something new, but I am a people person and um, I like to be in a space. I like to feel the energy and all of that jazz. Um, but I would say that uh, finding new ways to be creative, absolutely, with um, actor coaching online, also doing play readings online, also doing reader's theater style online, also doing uh, radio drama. My class um, did, a, did a 180. We had to change an assignment when we went online completely. And instead of my directing class directing their scenes live, we, we did radio drama. And so they, we learned, we all learned a new discipline and they did amazing. And we have radio dramas that they can add to, <laughs> to their reels. And it was, it was fantastic. So I agree, learning new skills, don't be afraid to make a mistake, diving in there and you know seeing what else can come up. I've heard that we all possess at least 700 uh, skills or, or um, passions that we don't even know we have. So if we just get out there and play, then hopefully we'll start to discover some of those things we didn't even know that were passions of ours. And I just want to say to Marcy and Val's point, um, I feel as a performing artist, when I have to record myself for these pre-recorded um, performances and stuff like that, like that's my closest I'm ever going to get to be a fine artist because then I can go back and say, like, oh no, I don't want that. I want to do this. Oh, I want it to look like this. And I didn't realize I even had that kind of gumption in me to see it on a visual space until the camera was in front of me. So I'm, I'm not stepping into your world now, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> but it has been really interesting. Well, and I think everybody kind of um, answered already my, my next question, uh, and I know it's been hard for me, is, um, you know, with beginning to rely so much on technology, um, that losing that basic human inter interaction that's so important to all the artistic disciplines, um, you know, I'm sorry, I still have issues going into um, an online art gallery and taking a tour. It, it, it just isn't the same as being there and surrounded by the art, um, the, you know, the, the, the visual art. And um, the audience is such a part of the process for performances that Q was kind of talking about a little bit, that that energy is all part of that. It's really difficult to uh, suddenly be without it. Um, so let's go ahead and um, well, I'm going to ask this audience question first. Um, has the, the current world with everything that's going on um, create, caused you to create more? Um, are you ultimately more artistic in creating more based off of everything that's going on despite the limitations? Yeah, you. Well, as an artist, uh, for me, and, and I still have the visual part. I still have my readings every Tuesday. So I do still have the open mic available to us and it's still there every Tuesday. Like I said, we are back out. But um, as far as what's going on, like I said before, uh, as an artist, I take things that are going on in the world and that's what I create from. Yes, there is a whole lot going on at this moment. So yes, I guess I'm writing more because I'm writing things about 
the pandemic. I'm writing things about not police per se, but maybe personally Breonna Taylor or George Floyd directly. I might not always put that out, but as as an artist, I'm inspired by things that I have to get it out or it just, it, it'll rot inside of me. So I have to get it out. So yes, there's a lot of things going on, but me, the new, because my daughter is 15 years old now and I'm kind of writing a roadmap for her. So to let her see what's taking place because she's in that vulnerable stage in her life right now at 15. So I'm kind of taking all this new stuff that's going on. I'm kind of using my writing as a way to explain it to her to make it easier and make the road a little bit easier for her so she can understand what she's about to go into in her adulthood. So I'm taking what's going on and I'm trying to use it to help what's coming up behind me see it because it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense to us, I know it doesn't make sense to our teenagers. You know, so I'm trying to help them navigate through it a little bit easier. So I'm using what's going on and I'm trying to create something so she can make it make more sense to her. So I guess I'm using that as a form of trying to help. So I guess in that sense, I am writing more because I'm trying to now to leave a roadmap for, for the ones coming up behind me. Kat? Um, at least for me, I'm used to being in runs for like three months and doing eight to nine shows a week and like only focusing on like my one show my one track and now I have time to like learn piano I have time to put out varied art but I I kind of feel like it's just parts of what make up my artistic way versus using like my entirety on stage so I'm putting out more content I guess that way more like individual song recordings individual like put some paintings up by uh, what have you, um, individual pieces, but not full creative endeavors in this mm -hmm. time. Yeah, Val. I just want to say I'm jealous, Kat, <laughs> 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 because from the university standpoint or the teaching standpoint, and I won't speak for all professors, but teaching visual art online is a challenge. Just, just a little bit. And so I have really spent a lot of time um, developing coursework. Um, and these are classes that I've been teaching for years, but to create content for online classes is amazingly time consuming, especially when I'm used to walking into a classroom and doing a demonstration with my hands or my, or my mouth or a laptop and a projector. Um, so I'm sure we'll all get there and, terms of being really, <laughs> um, you know, mastering time management. But um, at this very moment, the only thing that's making art is my brain, um, because I am so busy teaching and um, staying on top of, of that part of my job. But um, luckily, I made a whole lot of art at the beginning of the year. So I feel really good inside about that. And um, and I've recently moved into a new house, which making home gives me some um, some of that outlet in terms of creativity. Making a beautiful space means a lot to me. So me personally, um, I'm excited to keep thinking um, about the work that I'm going to make for the new show coming up in 2021. <laughs> but until then, <laughs> I'll be on my computer. <laughs> Marcy? I will have to agree with you, Valerie, so much. And thank you so much for bringing that perspective. Um, the first part of the process, I will say, was uh, I didn't want to create anything um, because I was trying to deal with the trauma. I was trying to deal with all of the things that were coming, uh, the pandemic being all of a sudden locked down in your house and that's it. And then being deathly afraid that my two-year-old was gonna, not my two-year-old, Lord, he's 15 months. My 15 month old was gonna get COVID, you know, all this stuff. So I just didn't have the, the, the cre I wasn't in a creative space. I wasn't inspired, I would say that. But as we got closer to the semester beginning, Valerie, uh, like you so wonderfully stated, theater is not supposed to be online. And teaching theater online was another source of like extreme 
I don't even know what to call it because my brain went like, what are you trying to tell me to do? <laughs> so coming up with all of these new and inventive and different ways and everybody was trying to do it at the same time. So it wasn't like I could go to someone and say, hey, how do we do improv online? They were like, I don't know. We're trying to figure it out too. <laughs> so I think uh, creating these new ways to do what we do and do it in the spirit of excellence um, has been an incredible amount of time, brain power, blood, sweat, and tears that I have not had room for anything else. As a matter of fact, maybe within the last month, I have submitted to uh, virtual auditions <laughs> because I'm just coming up from, and I was able to sneak those in real quick before, <laughs> before we get to midterms and all this kind of stuff. So man, Valerie, I agree wholehearted with you about that. Arts online is very difficult. So, Lloyd, did you have something or? No, I'm on the same page. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so uh, let's, uh, Anna, if we can bring up the next poll. And um, while, while they're voting on this, I wanna go ahead and um, kind of go into the next question. Um, how do you see your discipline changing long term based on the recent environment? Um, we talk a lot about eras in arts uh, kind of across the board. Um, do, you, do you guys see this as that a new era? Um, I'm hoping it's not a new virtual era, uh, but because uh, I miss people. Uh, but is there is this it, do you see this as a beginning of something new and different? Um, for, for the artistic community. Let's start with Val. Um, I just wanna say that I do see um, the beauty of artists that I love so much. We're so creative, we're problem solvers. We are, we are taught how to solve problems and um, I'm seeing that happening all across the board, um, particularly with musical artists, musicians, even making videos through Zoom, just making the best of this moment that they can possibly make, which is beautiful and uplifting. From visual artists, um, a friend of mine is curating this amazing project where they're hiring artists to create designs for planes to draw in the sky over, um, ice uh, institutions and raise awareness that, you know, these things are happening and it's not going to go away and we want to walk outside and read these messages in the sky and make some, make some noise. And you can um, follow these airplanes around all over the country on their website that they've built. And so you know what day you can walk outside if they're going to fly over your over your neighborhood and um it's pretty amazing um they're going to fly over new orleans um in october 30th just fyi keep your eyes peeled um but just the creative ways in which we figured out how to bring people together to see the same thing socially distance is pretty interesting and um, i can really appreciate that and i feel like that's not going to stop Who else? Yeah, Kat. So uh, for right now, especially in theater and what is happening with actors equity, uh, with contracts, I'm foreseeing uh, a, a more virtual period, at least probably for the next two years, which hurts my heart so much. But I, I do see it as a reality, especially um, with how many theaters are kind of getting blacklisted, uh, putting on put on the do not work list, um, especially people that want to stay in good standing to get in the union, stay with the union, what have you. I do see a period of virtual content, and at least once theater comes back, I I was so used to the in person auditions, and now that everything had to go virtual, and all these casting agencies had to go virtual. I don't think we're going to be like 100% back at like Pearl Studios or, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see those cattle calls with 500 people down the block happening anytime soon. They have the ability to 
have everyone submit videos and watch for 15 seconds, swipe to the next one, swipe to the next one. They have that, that skill now. I don't see it disappearing anytime soon. And I think because we have been in isolation, a lot of playwrights are gonna be coming up with more um, quarantine centric content or virtual content, content that's made to be in our little squares. I think that will continue to show up. It'll, it'll be relevant to all of us, you know? Right. So that's what I see happening. Lloyd? Um, I think the uh, same in the um, performing arts, uh, particularly in opera. I think uh, the majority of the opera world is completely ignorant of video technology. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we're, I think we're now coming into a space where everyone's either jumping on top of it and trying to learn and really getting that down, even on a regional opera company level, it's like we have to know some basics about that. I mean, uh, um, the big wigs of the opera world are complaining that they are not getting royalties from the Metropolitan Opera while they're doing their streaming on demand for productions they did 10, 20, 30 years ago. You know, and so these are the kind of things that the film industry has already worked out and they've been doing and the pop music industry has been doing, but now the opera industry is like, oh, wait, wait we gotta figure out how to manage the, in this space and create in this space. So I think that's one of the big changes. And of course, going back to um, this ra racial reform that we're kind of beginning to ha see happen in this country, um, I think that is pushing things um, in the direction where there can be more inclusivity and diversity on the stage. We're seeing it in television and commercials now, but now you know the Metropolitan Opera has said they're going to open with a opera by Terrence Blanchard, um, famous black uh, um, trumpet player and composer. You know, and so that is the first black opera composed by a black person in the Metropolitan Opera in its whole 137 year history. So I want to be very clear, like the, in my artistic realm, it, there's a lot just starting, you know? And I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I can't wait to see these stories and be a part of these stories, but I do think it might be a little bumpy ride to, to getting to where we're seeing a very inclusive kind of season from these opera companies and from the opera industry. Right. Yeah, Q, go ahead. Uh, for me, it's going to stay the same. Uh, if anything, it's, it's, it's opened up more doors. I'm going to continue to do what I've been doing. I'm not going to change that, but more doors have opened now. So now I have a little bit more of a skill set that I can use for the future. But for the most part, I know that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So, you know, I've lived through a whole lot of things that have shaken the fabric of this nation. You know, whether it was the AIDS epidemic or the crack cocaine epidemic, you know, it's, and as a writer, my job is to write out through all of those atrocities that take place and continue to write through until we get to the other side of it. So this is just the same thing. I got to continue to write my way through it until we get to the other side of it and something else will come up and I got to write my way through it until we get to the other side of that as well. So, but if anything, it's opened up more doors so that I can use more avenues to, to travel down to get to that road that I'm trying to get to now, so. Awesome. So um, I think we're kind of at the end of our time. Um, like I said, I, we could talk for hours on this. Um, and um, I want to remind both, both uh, my panelists as well as the audience members that uh, this isn't the first time that we have, um, you know, the artistic community has basically had to hit the pause button. Um, speaking from the theatrical world, um, some of Shakespeare's best plays were written during the the, the plague uh, years. Um, and so it really is, um, um, I, I think we're, we're a lot of artists, um, especially these on, on that have been with us tonight, uh, have talked about basically um, while there's a pause in what we normally do, um, we're developing new skill sets. We're thinking about what's coming next. Um, you know, it's great that the Met is is uh, taking this opportunity to revisit those what they've been doing and look at it in a new light, uh, which is is awesome. And as a, as someone who is a producer, um, 
it gets so difficult at times when you're just going, going, going to start thinking outside your box. So I, 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 I'm very, I applaud them taking the breath, taking the time to move forward and to look at things in a different way. Um, so that's, um, that's huge. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I want to thank um, uh, all of our sponsors. Um, and um, Anna just put something in um, the, um, the, the chat uh, about our next lecture to make sure you register for that. It's going to be an incredible lecture. Um, and um, Nick, um, do you want to say anything else before we wrap up? I just can't thank everybody enough. Um, from the behind the scenes, we've been getting so many compliments and accolades on the panelists and their, their perspectives. Um, we, we can't say thank you enough. So thank you all. I appreciate everybody uh, spending this hour with us.